Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. Hey everyone, and welcome to a very special review that I've been planning for almost the whole year. Since it's Christmas time, what better way to start it off with the first of two reviews that I got planned, Die Hard, starring Bruce Willis, Alan Rickman, Reginald Vell Johnson, and a bunch of other people you may or may not recognize. I've been wanting to talk about Die Hard on my channel for a long time, and this year it turns 30 years old, which is just unbelievable. The anniversary of the release date was earlier this year in July, but I thought it would be appropriate to talk about it during Christmas time, because <laughs> this is a debate that's been going on for years, that is it a Christmas movie? Is it not a Christmas movie? I say yes, but also no, and I'll, I'll explain why, because it's set during Christmas time, so yeah, it is a Christmas movie, but it's set out in LA where it's pretty much warm all year round and it's not as cold as it gets in the northeastern part of the United States. For me, it's one of those movies that you can watch any time of the year and it still has the same effect regardless. But what else can I say about Die Hard that hasn't already been said by now? I mean, it's been 30 years and so many people have talked about it by now, but you know what? Let's talk about it anyway. The first Die Hard, directed by John McTiernan, who's the director of various other films like Die Hard 3, The Hunt for Red October, and Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'm sure you guys know the plot by now. Die Hard is about a man named John McClane, a New York cop who's in town on Christmas Eve to visit his estranged wife, Holly, at this place called Nakatomi Plaza out in LA. But then a group of armed men, led by Hans Gruber, break into the building, create a hostage situation, and where their intentions are to steal the $640 million that the corporation has locked in its vault. They're like, what could go wrong. We got everything planned. This is going to go off without a cinch. But there's one thing that they did not count on. John McClane's there, who's going to screw everything up for them. And now we have our movie. But Die Hard, as many people have said before, is an action classic because this movie has been redone in so many different movies so many times. You got your lone gunman trying to take out the main bad guys one by one, trying to save the hostages from whatever scenario they're in. Except this movie is still the godfather of that kind of action movie, that every movie that's tried to follow up on that since then hasn't even come close to it because of how simple the premise is. You got your lone gunman in the building. You got the terrorists, who their only objective is to steal the money. It's a very simple set of characterization that you need for John McClane. From the very first frame when you meet him, you immediately relate to this guy because he's afraid of flying, and the guy next to him tells him to make fists with his toes in order to overcome his fear of flying. Son of a bitch. Fists with your toes. And the thing is, the action starts very early on in Die Hard, and you have a very limited time to care about John McClane. From the way the music cues up, the famous jingle bell sound that you hear in the musical score, it lets you know right off the bat that something intense is going to happen soon. And the tension builds up when you see Hans Gruber and his men show up at Nakatomi Plaza setting up everything they need in order to put their plan into action. And John McClane, played by Bruce Willis, is probably the most relatable protagonist in action movie history. You got guys like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, and you have Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, Matt Damon as Jason Bourne, and Tom Cruise as Ethan Hunt. Those last three that I mentioned, Jason Bourne, Indiana Jones, and Ethan Hunt, they're pretty relatable protagonists in their own right, but John McClane is probably the most human out of any action hero that we've ever seen. He's just a normal guy, a normal everyday man, who's just trying to make a living as a police officer, and he's put into this situation where he has to rely on his own wit, and barely anybody is out there to help him. But he's also the perfect amount of a smart ass also. It's a guy from New York City, and New Yorkers in general are known to be very blunt, and they'll tell you how they feel, and Bruce Willis is the perfect guy to play that type of character. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. And we've seen that many times before in the past from his other movies. And also a little forewarning here, there's gonna be a couple words here that I don't like to say in my reviews that much. So if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, just be warned. I promise I'm not gonna use them too much, maybe twice, but just be warned. There's gonna be a couple times when I say the F-bomb, so. But John McClane is trying to reunite with his estranged wife, Holly, who works for the Nakatomi Corporation out in LA. She moved from New York to LA when she got the job, but John wasn't really willing to be there to support her and wasn't willing to move out to LA initially. So when he shows up there, He's trying to reconnect with her, but it's not going so well. And then, all of a sudden, the terrorists come in and the whole thing blows up. And he manages to sneak away while the terrorists are taking over. And he tries to figure out what's going on and try to find a way to get help from the outside. And there we're introduced to Hans Gruber, played by the late Alan Rickman, who you might know as Professor Snape from Harry Potter. And when we first meet him, he wants to talk to Mr. Takagi. 
and he uses Mr. Takagi, who's one of the head honchos of the Nakatomi Corporation, in order to get his access code into the vault so they could take the money. But Mr. Takagi doesn't want to cooperate, so eventually Hans Gruber kills him, with John McClane nearby seeing it from a distance, and John is helpless to do anything about it. As many people have pointed out, Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber is just absolutely perfect. He is so, so amazing as Hans Gruber. I mean, he is the perfect opposite of John McClane. He's a very straight businessman kind of guy, very sophisticated type of personality as opposed to John McClane, who's just a cop who's very foul mouth and just an average Joe from off the street. It's the perfect type of hero and villain relationship in an action movie. And the way that their hero-villain relationship is established, there's only two scenes with them together, which is really kind of cool when you think about it because the writers had to build up this relationship through them talking to each other on their walkie-talkies. They barely have any scenes together, but the dialogue is so well written by the writer of this movie. I can't remember the guy's name. And it's just so entertaining to see these two guys go back at each other and seeing how John is just continuously drilling into Hans Gruber's skin and Hans Gruber's trying to get a handle on him and it's not working. Thought I told all of you I want radio silence until further. Oh, I'm very sorry, Hans. I didn't get that message. Maybe you should have put it on a bulletin board. I thought you and Carl and Franco might be lonely, so I wanted to give you a call. This is very kind of you, but you are most troublesome for a security guard. Eh, sorry Hans, wrong guess. Would you like to go for double jeopardy where the scores can really change? Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki motherfucker. And thus a catchphrase was born. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. And they say it in every Die Hard movie. Yes, even the fourth one, but that's a different story. But when you watch that scene, McLean's response is just perfect. It is amazing. And Alan Rickman's line delivery, oh my god. It's just similar to Willem Dafoe as Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin in the 2002 Spider-Man movie. The line delivery is just perfect. Nice suit. John Phillips, London. I have two myself. Rumor has it Arafat buys his there. I read the article in Forbes. Mr. Takagi, I'm afraid work must intrude and my associate Theo has some questions for you. Sort of fill in the blanks questions, actually. It's a little funny story. I first watched this when I was about 12 or 13 years old. My parents were very trusting with me at certain points in my life and my youth with certain movies like Die Hard. So they allowed me to watch Die Hard and I absolutely loved it as a kid. And to this day I still do, as you could probably tell by now. But a friend of mine at the time when we were watching this, I was about 13 years old. It was the summer of 03. My friend pointed out to me, did you know that the guy who plays Hans Gruber is Professor Snape? And I went, what? Seriously, listen to him. And I listened closely to his voice and I took a closer look at his face and I went, Oh my god, it is him! And to this day, it still kind of blows my mind, but it shows you just how great of an actor he is. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I can't really say much else, because Alan Rickman, God rest his soul, amazing, amazing actor. And he deserves all the credit that he gets as Hans Gruber. He's that good. And the other supporting characters do their job just as well. You got John McClane's wife, Holly, played by Bonnie Bell... De I... I can't remember her last name, and I don't know how to... I don't know how to pronounce it either, but she does her job just fine. And she's not your typical cliche damsel in distress. She doesn't take any crap from any of the bad guys. And <laughs> the request that she gives to Hans Gruber about letting certain people go to the bathroom and giving a couch to this pregnant woman that's out in the uh, hostage group. What idiot put you in charge? You did. When you murdered my boss. Personally, I pass up on the opportunity. I don't enjoy being this close to you. But then you got other guys like Hans's right-hand man, Carl, played by the late Alexander Gudanov. I... Not sure how to pronounce his name. You might know him as Daniel Hawklighter from the movie Witness with Harrison Ford. Complete 180 turn from how he was in Witness. Witness, he was a very peaceful and very kind gentleman. This one, he's a former military and ruthless killer. And his brother is one of the other terrorists that John kills earlier on. When he sets off the fire alarm in order to get some attention from the outside and the guy goes to see what's going on, that's Carl's brother, so John kills him and Carl wants revenge. And seeing him continuously, continuously getting so irritated of every passing opportunity in order to kill John McClane, it's just so entertaining, especially when Holly sees him freaking out about something and she goes, only John can drive somebody that crazy. I don't want to keep emphasizing this too much, but John McClane fouling up everything for the terrorists, it's just so, so entertaining. It's like Spider-Man in one specific way. He keeps getting in the bad guy's way so much and seeing the villains get so frustrated with him that they'll do anything to get him out of the way in order to accomplish their goal. It's just, it's perfect. 
There's, there's, there's no other way you could have done this. And other characters like Sergeant Al Powell, played by Reginald Vell Johnson. Similar situation with Hans and John McClane, but the partnership that Al and John share with each other, the partnership that they form over the radio, I can imagine that's very likely hard to do for a screenwriter because you have to build everything over the walkie-talkie. It's this cop that John McClane doesn't even see, nor does he know from Adam, but he's the only support that the guy has in order to get help from down below. Because all the other LAPD officers that are there, they don't believe anything John's saying. They don't want anything to do with him, especially Dwayne Robinson, the chief of police, who's played by the late Paul Gleason, if I'm not mistaken. You also might know him as the principal from The Breakfast Club, and he's just, just as much of a douchebag in this movie as he is in Breakfast Club. And he's practically one of the biggest idiots around. I mean, seriously. Especially when John throws the dead body out the window in order to get the cops' attention. And Chief Robinson is just oblivious to the whole idea that, hey, maybe this guy's telling the truth. Excuse me, sir, but what about the body that fell out the window? Well, who knows? Probably some stockbroker got depressed. The body had gunshot wounds. What, what do you think happened to the guy? Do you think he shot himself in the legs? How stupid can you be? <laughs> I mean, whatever. Just another reason for us to want to root for John McClane more, which is always a really good help. And he has a really good comeback line towards Chief Robinson. It's, it, watch the scene and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's, it gets me every time. But the director of this movie, John McTiernan, does a really great job here at helming the scenes together from the opening to when the action starts right to the very end. Because the entire time, it feels like very low budget independent film like. It's not your typical big explosive type of action extravaganza. There's a very subtle intensity to it. There's also kind of a laid backness to the whole thing. There's no typical shaky cam up close imagery that you would usually see in stereotypical action movies these days. There are some up close shots in certain scenes, especially when John and Carl are going at each other and John just like wailing on the guy so hard. But it's done in a way where you can tell what's going on and it's not a cheap way to cover a bad stunt work. And you feel the intensity throughout the whole thing, especially with the music composed by Michael Kamen, who would later go on to compose the musical score for the first X-Men and for the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. It has that famous Christmas jingle sound that you hear sprinkled throughout the movie. And certain pieces like... In more ways than one, it's kind of echoed throughout the rest of the Die Hard series, but it all adds to the suspense and tension that John McTiernan does a really good job of building up throughout this entire movie, and a sense of fear also. But with certain scenes, like the scene where Hans and John meet for the first time face to face, but the, both of them are kind of uncertain as to who the other is, but John obviously can tell that this guy's not who he says he is, Bill Clay. Oh God, please, no, you're one of the marching. Don't kill me, don't kill me, please. I'm not gonna hurt you. And they're talking and then he says, I'm a cop from New York. New York. The tension just builds and builds and builds. And right up to the moment where the action starts happening again. And also the scene of fear that happens is when the real sleazy guy named Ellis um, Holly's co-worker, who has a really bad habit of snorting throughout the entire thing, obviously doing lines on the table. He's trying to defuse the situation his way, but actually ends up blowing John McClane's cover because he uses the name Roy in order to cover his tracks because he knows the terrorists are listening on the radio. He tries to tell Hans that he's John McClane's buddy. He said, listen, let me talk to him. I can get this guy to surrender. Hans, Bobby, I'm your white knight. The guy upstairs is screwing things up. I can give him to you but uh, that ends up going south. And you see in the scene where John McClane's pleading with Alice, Alice, tell him you don't know me, they're gonna kill you. The way the camera zooms in on John McClane is he's pleading with both of those guys on the radio. You could see the fear on his face and you could hear it in his voice. Bruce Willis does an amazing job conveying those emotions and I wish he would do that more often these days, but that's, a, that's another story. But probably the best moment in this movie for me is after McClane gets into another shootout with Hans and his guys, she's in Fensta. Shoot the glass. They shoot the glass, he has to run over it barefoot and he ends up getting a piece of glass stuck in his foot. And after he manages to put a homemade bandage on his foot, he starts to get worried that he's probably not gonna get out of this alive. So he asks Al over the radio to find his wife Holly and say, I should have been more supportive. She's the best thing that could ever happen to a guy like me. And she never heard me say that I was sorry. I want you to tell her that, Al. I want you to tell her that uh, John said that he was sorry. You can see that he's finally come around, that he's the one who's been the jerk in the marriage, and that he wishes he could have done a better job. But Al encourages him to keep on fighting, and that he will be able to reconcile with his wife eventually. And at the climax of the movie, 
after John gets into his big fight with Carl. He manages to get up onto the roof and stop the hostages from getting away in the helicopter because the FBI shows up. They shut the power down to the building, which gives the terrorists free access to the vault. And he tries to warn them that the whole roof's wired to blow. They're not going to listen to him. So he starts firing his gun all over the place trying to get him downstairs. The FBI sees this and they think he's one of the bad guys, and, they start, and so they start shooting at him. So in an act of desperation, he takes a fire hose, wraps it around him, and uses it to swing over into a window. And he does it just as the roof blows up. Is that over the top? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things where you go, I'm not sure if that would work that way. But the way it's filmed, and because by this point you actually care about John McClane, I'm able to look past that stuff. Because, let's face it, every single Die Hard movie, including the fifth one, has over the top moments. It's a movie. At some level, at some point, you have to suspend your disbelief. Movies are never 100% realistic. So he manages to get through the window, confront Hans, who's got his wife hostage, and John has a, his pistol taped behind his back with only two rounds left in it. So all he's got left is Hans in front of him and his cohort, Eddie, who was posing as one of the front desk guys downstairs. And this is a cap gun. Relax, it's not a real gun. You can see the orange right here. Still a cowboy. Mr. McLean, Americans all alike. Well, this time, John Wayne does not walk off into the sunset with Grace Kelly. It's Gary Cooper. Enough jokes. You would have made a pretty good cowboy yourself, Hans. Oh, yeah. What, what was it you said to me before? yippee ki -yay. Mother f And after laughing for a good minute, Hans gets ready to shoot. John pulls his gun out shoots Hans and then kills the other guy. Hans falls out the window, almost taking Holly with him, but John leaps to her rescue and manages to save her. Hans falls to his death. <laughs> He's dead. So John and Holly are able to get out of the building alive, safe and sound. John finally meets up with Sergeant Al Powell. And then Carl shows up out of the blue, one last attempt to kill John McClane. John ducks to protect Holly. But then Carl is shot and killed by Sergeant Al Powell. It's a great payoff for him because we learn earlier, John and Al were talking over the radio, that Al accidentally shot a young 13-year-old kid who had a toy gun and he thought it was a real gun. And after that, he couldn't bring himself to pull his gun on anybody anymore. But in that situation, just like any cop would, he reacted, and in a way rectifies his past mistake. He was able to save someone that he cared about. And also the limo driver, Argyle. <laughs> Hilarious. And I love the sound that the guy Theo makes when Argyle punches him in the garage. <laughs> it's perfect. If there's one complaint I have with this movie though, how did Carl manage to survive? Because John wraps his big chain around the guy's neck and has him hanging from at least 15 feet in the air. And the last thing we see of him, he's just going like this. Any normal human being wouldn't be able to survive that. Now, okay, he's former military, so maybe he found a way to survive, but still, I find that to be a little bit of a stretch. Nitpicking aside, it makes for a great payoff for Reginald Bell Johnson's character. All in all, Die Hard, I think, is an excellent, excellent movie. Arguably the best action film ever made. I don't have a specific favorite action movie, but if someone says this is their favorite, I'm not going to argue with you because, hey, you could watch it today, 30 years later, which is... Just crazy that it was 30 years ago, and it still holds up. There's not much else I can say about Die Hard except, well done, ladies and gentlemen, well done. So, those are my thoughts on the first Die Hard. What are your thoughts on the first Die Hard, and what's your favorite of the Die Hard movies? I think I'm gonna be talking about those more in the future, but for now I thought Die Hard 1 would be appropriate. So comment below and tell me what your thoughts are on Die Hard, and stay tuned for my review of A Christmas Story coming up soon. I hope you all have a really merry, merry Christmas, and lastly, yippee ki mother. Thank <laughs> you.